Luke chapter 7. And we will read one verse out loud together, but uh, don't close your Bibles as after I pray and you're seated. I'll read several more verses <clears throat> to give the context of what's going on and what leads up to what Jesus says in this verse. Luke chapter 7. And did I say verse 48? Yes. Okay. I'll rewind the tape here. No. Uh, verse 48. And let's read that out loud together. Ready? And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, what has been done for us by you and uh, by Christ. We thank you for bringing us together today. God, we ask now that you would speak to us, that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and our minds and uh, draw us closer to you. We come as a, a people that are needy and know that only you can fulfill those needs. So we ask that you do so now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's back up to verse 36 here. <clears throat> it says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. Now, this is, uh, I looked up the, the word behind that word, sinner. And it's not just somebody who commits a sin. It's somebody who is uh, devoted to a life of sin. And, and so the world would say, that's a really bad sinner. Now, we're all sinners. We know that. Uh, but this is someone who has purposefully given themselves, you know, somebody told me once, uh, they asked, well, sure, or they, they made a statement, sure, you can lose your salvation. You have to keep being good. I said, no, not according to the Bible. And they said, if I believe that, then I would sin all I wanted to. In other words, they would devote themselves to sin. And uh, uh, years later, I heard a preacher say he had entered in the same type of discussion. He said, I do believe that, and I sin more than I want to. Amen. And that's the, the fact of it is when you understand the love of God and the love of Christ, you'll find yourself sinning more than what you want to. Even though you know it's not going to affect the status of your salvation uh, or where you're going to go where you die, it's not going to affect your eternal destination, you still realize that's more. I uh, heard a fellow uh, years ago came here and spoke for us. He was a missionary to the Amish. And he was talking about a <clears throat> an Amishman who had gotten saved. Somebody shared the gospel with him. He got saved. And <clears throat> he joined the Baptist church. That's where the soul winner had gone out from. And he started coming to church, got baptized, joined the church, got very, very active. I mean, he was bringing in people every week. He was working in the church. He was Every time they had something going on, he was one of the first ones there and one of the last ones gone. And uh, just very active in the church. And the preacher preached on eternal salvation, eternal security of the believer. <clears throat> and he asked the preacher after services, he says, uh, um, you mean I can't lose my salvation? He said, no. He said, that makes me even more excited for the Lord. And so he was excited about his salvation before, and yet he thought maybe he could lose it. He said, now that I know I'm saved forever, I'm, I'm even more happy, and I love the Lord even more. And that's the way it ought to be. And, and so, but here is a woman... She has purposefully given herself to sin. The Bible doesn't say what kind. Uh, it just says she's, she's, a, she's a sinner. One that has dedicated herself to that uh, practice. Uh, so let's start verse 37 again. Behold a woman in the city which was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house. Brought an alabaster box of ointments. And stood at his feet behind him weeping. And began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointments. Now, when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon... I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. 
And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. Now keep in mind, what's the big deal about water for your feet? They didn't have paved sidewalks. It was dirt roads. It was dusty roads. They did not have enclosed footwear. It's all open, open sandals, open-toed shoes, open top of the foot shoes, open back of the foot shoes, open sides of the feet shoes. The only thing covered was the bottom to protect you from stones and what else, you know, scorpions. I don't know what all you might step on out there. Uh, I guess the, you'd want the side and top covered for, to be protected against scorpions. But anyways. So it was customary to have some water inside the door. And maybe if you were wealthy enough, you had a servant there that would wash your feet when you came into somebody's house as a guest. You know, some people, they'll have a little mat next to the door and they'll say, please take your shoes off when you come into the house. And, but in those days, it's please wash your feet as you come into the house. And so he's, he's kind of scolding this man named Simon, not Simon Peter, this is a different Simon. He said, uh, you invited me to your house, you didn't give me water to where I could wash my own feet. So let, let's, let's uh, move on here. Um, verse 44, we'll start there again. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Now the Bible says for a woman, her glory is her hair. And so the one thing that she might have to be able to be happy about, she's using that to wash somebody else's filthy, grimy feet. Verse 45, Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. Now the, uh, the men greeted the, each other with a kiss. It's still in the Middle East. They'll grab you, they'll pull you in, and it's a kiss on each side of the cheek. Um, and uh, so he said, you didn't even greet me with a kiss. My head of oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Verse 47, wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. He said, you can tell that she thought great, her sins were great and were many because she has poured, this outpouring of love demonstrates her understanding of a great forgiveness of her sins. Do we see here in verse 48, thy sins are forgiven. And let's consider that heaven is the result of having one's sins forgiven. You're not going to go to heaven without having your sin problem taken care of first. And, and uh, if your sins aren't forgiven, you're not going to go into heaven. You have to have, they have to be paid for in somewhere, and the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so you can accept the death of somebody else as the payment for your sins, or you have to pay for them yourself by dying and going to hell. And nobody else is qualified to pay for your sins except for the one who never himself sinned. And so Jesus paid the payment. Jesus paid the price. He, when he was hanging on the cross dying and his blood was being spilled and poured out, that was for us. That was as a payment for your sin and for my sin. And so we can have forgiveness of our sins. We can be justified. Our account can be wiped clean. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be whiter than snow. And in their place... Not only is our, our record wiped clear, but the righteousness of Christ is put in its place. But without the forgiveness of sin, there's no hope. There's no way to get into heaven. You just can't do it. You say, well, I'm going to pay for it myself. Then you will pay with an eternity of hellfire. That's how you pay for your own sin. 
And God said, you can pay yourself, but you don't have to. I don't want you to. I didn't create hell for you. I, heaven is where I want you to be. My presence is where I want you to be. And I want it bad enough that I'll sacrifice my only begotten son for that to happen. Amen. And so heaven is the result of having your sins forgiven. And the complete fulfillment of that happens either at the rapture or at your passing. And I say the complete fulfillment of that because I believe God wants us to have a little heaven here. We don't have to wait for the sweet by and by. We can have it in the nasty now and now. And our lives can more, you know, some people are going to have some culture shock when they get to heaven. And other people, they'll get to heaven and yes, it's going to be a big step, but they'll say, this is the next natural step. This is the direction I've been heading all my life. My life has been getting closer and closer to what it is like here since I got saved. And other people, they got saved and they didn't, get any, they didn't do anything. You know, Jesus said, when you pray, when you pray, say. One of the things we're supposed to say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, who's on earth? I'm on earth. When I pray that, I'm saying, God, I want your will to be done in my life the same way it's done in heaven, without question, without reserve, without worry or concern. Where I worked, the, uh, the man who's in charge of divvying out the money for the company, the chief financial officer, I want to be real friendly to him because he's in charge of when we get new trucks. <laughs> and... And I'm the recipient of the, of the latest new truck. And so when I say, hey, thank you, I still appreciate having that truck. Because the two that I was in before, none of them have working air conditioning right now. And the one I have now, compared to them, has working air conditioning. But uh, so he, he came to visit us from headquarters uh, this past week. And I went over to say hi to him. And I said, what's the good news? And he said, well, he said, the good news is we're getting a different health insurance company next year. <laughs> and, and for where we're at, for many of the employees, that certainly is good news. And uh, uh, my boss, the manager of our location, said, oh, that's great news. I said, this from the man who isn't even on our insurance. His wife has good insurance where she works, so he's, he's on her insurance. I said, you don't have to deal with anything that, that we deal with here as far as insurance-wise. Um, and we laughed and chuckled at that. I started to walk away to get in the truck and go look busy for the rest of the day. And he said, oh, wait a minute. He said, the real good news is Jesus is alive. And I said, that's right. That's the real good news. But then in my head, I said, and also, he's not worried about anything. You ever stop and think about that? Not one moment, not one second has God ever had to chew his nails and wonder how things are going to turn out and get concerned and get worried and get uptight and, and been out. Oh, my goodness. What? Adam, what did you do? What's going, what do we do now? You know, things, you could write a, a, a really big book, things that have never been said in heaven. Where would that come from? What do we do now? Did anybody else... See that coming? That's never, there's never been a moment of panic in heaven. God's on his throne. And nothing's going to change that. If Satan couldn't take him off, nobody is going to be able to. Satan tried and he got fired. And for eternity, he will be fired. So heaven, the complete fulfillment, yeah, that happens when I pass away. That, or if Jesus comes first and calls us up, that happens then. But until then, we can be working towards that fulfillment. Now, I believe there's two categories of people that are going to enjoy heaven more than, than others. First of all, those who are aware of their own sinfulness. Here's a woman, the Bible says she was a sinner, meaning she was dedicated to sin. And the other character at this event is a man named Simon, who is a Pharisee. He has dedicated his life to religiousness. 
So you would think that's the opposite of being dedicated to sin. And yet, if both of them died in their sins, they would both go to hell. In fact, Simon's hell might wind up being a hotter hell. Because as a man who's devoted his life to the Bible, he knew better than the woman did. She hadn't devoted her life to the, to the scriptures. She hadn't devoted her life to temple service, to serving, you know, to the best of her ability and sincerity, the Lord. But those who are aware of their own sinfulness, and so this woman was a sinner, a person devoted to sin. And it's interesting because Jesus doesn't tell us her name. But he does mention Simon by name. I was reading through this and I thought, that's interesting. What's her name? We don't know. We don't know. See, Jesus wasn't worried about embarrassing Simon. He said, in fact, he said, uh, I came in your house, you didn't even water to wash my feet. Simple courtesies you didn't, you didn't extend. You felt you were too good. See, because Simon was treating both Jesus and this woman in pride, his own pride. He felt superior to both of them. Now, he wanted Jesus as his guest, but I think he wanted Jesus as his guest so Jesus could be impressed with him. And sometimes we want people to see something that we have not so they can enjoy that item or enjoy that thing, but it's so that we can brag about what we've done and what we have and what we've accomplished. Come here, I want you to see my brand new car. Wow, you sure have it all together. And that's, that's, the, that's what some people want. And others say, hey, look at this car I got. And they throw you the keys. Let's go for a ride. They want you to enjoy that with them. Not to be impressed with them specifically, but just to have some enjoyment of it. But here this woman, she comes in, she's not mentioned. So we see a contrast between humble and proud. There's humility in the woman. And she doesn't necessarily speak a word. She's behind Jesus. She begins weeping. She gets down on her hands and knees and begins to weep upon his feet and it takes her hair down and is washing his feet with her hair. She has this, after she's washed that, she's got this alabaster box and she breaks the seal of it and breaks it open and pours that ointment on his feet. And this prideful Pharisee, huh, if Jesus was who he claims to be or who other people claim to be, if he really was a prophet, if there was something special about him, he would know what everybody around here knows about this woman, and he wouldn't let her touch him. And Jesus turns around and says, uh, Simon, I got something I need to tell you. Oh, Master, do say on. Pray tell what's on your mind. And Jesus looks at her and he says, See this woman? Since I came in, you didn't offer me any water. You didn't kiss me. You didn't greet me. There was not a, a cordial welcome. But she hasn't stopped crying. And she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped it off with her hair. And she's anointed my feet. And uh, uh, before he got to all that, he said, let me tell you this story about these two people that owed money. One owed a whole bunch and one owed a little bit. But they were both forgiven. Which one's going to be more appreciative? Which one will be will love their creditor more? He said, well, the one who owed a bunch. And so those who are aware of their own sinfulness, I think they're going to enjoy heaven a little bit more. See, a big problem in many Christians is that they believe they deserve hell a little bit less than others. And the fact of the matter is those two people, that woman and that man, both were deserving of hell, just like every one of us is deserving of hell. But sometimes in Christianity, people get this idea, well, I don't deserve it as much as that guy. 
And when we talk about the blood of Jesus Christ being shed for everybody, the question inevitably comes up, well, even for Adolf Hitler? And I'll tell you right now, if Adolf Hitler had repented and turned to Jesus for salvation, God would have saved him and washed his sins away just like he did yours. Yeah, that's right. and, but our problem is we think we deserve hell less than he deserved hell. But our sin... Well, I, I certainly am not guilty of the murder of millions. You're guilty of the murder of the Son of God. It doesn't have to be millions. See, Adam became guilty of that when he took that fruit. We'd say that's just petty theft. We wouldn't even call the police for that. There's a fellow in, in, uh, in Lexington right now. He didn't like what the policies that the neighborhood he lived in, the trailer park he lives in, they enacted a certain policy and they, they came and they made him aware of that policy. So he got his gun, went to the office, and started shooting the office up. And the police came and did nothing. Now, if they're not going to do anything for somebody shooting up somebody else's office, for dead sure they're not going to do anything if somebody steals a fruit off the neighbor's lemon tree. Or someone steals a grape off their grapevine or an apple out of their tree. Well, they didn't do anything about that guy shooting the place up. And they knew him. They knew him by name. They recognized him. We know who he is. Not really anything we can do. No, not, you can do something, just not anything you're going to do. And so we have a, we have a distorted view of right and wrong and crime and, and everything else. And, and as humans, we take it lightly, especially whatever it is that we ourselves might be guilty of. And yet Adam... The sin that he committed was enough to condemn the entire human race of all time to an eternity in hell. That's how serious God takes sin. But we look at sin and we think, well, I'm not as deserving of hell. And the flip side of that is, I actually deserved heaven a little bit more than he deserves heaven. If anybody deserved hell, it was that guy. It was Stalin, it was Lenin, it was Pol Pot, it was Adolf Hitler. If anybody deserved hell, it was those politicians who anybody that had an opposing view, they said, we either need to lock them up, retrain them in indoctrination camps, or just shoot them in the head. If somebody's from a different race, they need to be killed. Those people deserve hell. But I'm pretty good. I mean, if anybody should go to heaven, it, it should. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't robbed any banks. I've worked hard. I've been faithful in my marriage. I've, I've helped people out. I go to church a couple times a year. I believe in God. I should, I should go to heaven. And that's, a, that's not just a problem amongst the lost. That's a problem amongst the saved. And here's a man who's devoted himself to religion. And he thinks, man, that woman's bad. And if Jesus really was a, a prophet, he wouldn't have anything to do with her. Let me read a verse here. Romans 7, 13 says this. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. And that's the problem that we have is that sin is not exceeding sinful to us. We think exceeding sinful, that's what somebody else is involved in. That's because we're not well versed in what God's commandments really are. Jesus said, here's some things you've heard about the commandments. You've heard, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if a man looketh on a woman to lust after her, he hath committed adultery with her in his heart. He said, think not. And a lot of people stopped right there. Think not. Yep, that's, you got it. I'm not going to think. He said, think not that I'm come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. What does the word fulfill mean? It means to fill full. He said, so far you've got a half a glass of law. That's what you got from Moses. That's what God gave you through Moses. He gave you half a glass. He said, I came to fill it up the rest of the way. He said, you've heard, 
Thou shalt not kill. But I'm going to tell you, if you hate your brother, you're guilty of committing murder. Boy, that filled the glass up the rest of the way. He said, I didn't come to get rid of the law. And our problem is we are not well versed enough in the law to know how bad of a sinner we really are. And so here in the book of Romans, God says, uh, hey, that law was given, that commandment, and, and you get familiar and you get to know the commandments, and that way sin becomes exceeding sinful. And it keeps you from becoming a Pharisee because you realize that your own sin is an exceeding sinful sin, not just somebody who has dedicated their life to sin. And so the, the, the group, you know, that, that Pharisee will not enjoy heaven. Let me say, Simon in Luke chapter 7, is not going to enjoy heaven as much as that woman is. See, I don't know if Simon made it, but Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. It's interesting because the following verses, and they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? <laughs> he's, he's done these other things now, but now he really took it to another level. He's forgiving people's sins. Only the one that is sinned against can forgive somebody's sins. The only thing I can forgive you of is something that you might have done against me. If you did something against somebody else, I can't give you forgiveness of that. I can't clear your slate on that. You didn't do anything against me. That's, that's, that's the silliness of, of some guy wearing his collar backwards and a dress, getting on one side of the booth behind a curtain and you're on the other side of the booth. And you go in and you say, uh, uh, I know you're not my dad, but I need you to forgive me of all my sins. Well, what did you do? Well, I did that. I kicked this guy in the shin and I cut that guy off in traffic and I cheated on my taxes and I lied on my job application. And, and uh, he said, well, say five Hail Marys and four of this and do that and, and go scrub this floor and, and all will be forgiven. He has no right to forgive me of something that I did to somebody else. He's putting himself in God's place. He's making himself equal to Jesus. That's blasphemy. That's heretical. To put yourself on the same level as God himself. And he's pretending that, that he can create God and manipulate him and speak for him. What, what arrogance that is. And, and so these people said, who is this that forgives sins? I'll tell you who it is. It's the Son of God. It's God himself. It's the one who has been sinned against. It's the one that is going to have to go to the cross to pay the price for your sin, Mr. Sitting at Meat with Simon. Jesus said to the woman, verse 50, and he said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. He said, lady, you're saved because of your faith. There's no quarrel between you and God anymore. She hadn't spoken a word. She heard Jesus came to this man's house and she walked in behind him and she just stood there and wept. And as the tears came down, she came down and she knelt and began to weep upon his feet and used her hair to wash that grime away and and, and the mud that had formed, and now it's what? Now her hair is caked with that. And she takes that alabaster box and pours that ointment over his feet. Why did she feel bad about her sin and Simon didn't? Because Simon felt he deserved heaven a little bit more and deserved hell a whole lot less than that woman. Two groups, two categories of people that are going to join heaven more. First, those who are aware of their own sinfulness. Second, those who have suffered from sin the most. Those who have suffered from sin the most. No doubt this woman had suffered from sin. No, no doubt she, she anguished about it. She's devoted herself to sin. Her life is dedicated to a life of sin. And the Bible doesn't tell us what that sin is. Why? Because God didn't have to. Because it doesn't matter what specific sin. It might have been a great variety of sins. But she had dedicated, she had not tried to begin. And she realized, 
Hey, this is just leaving me dead. It's just leaving me empty. This is destroying my life. It's destroying everything around me. And, and boy, she is suffering from sin the most. And those that are going to enjoy heaven the most are the ones that have suffered from sin the most, either directly or they themselves have lived a life of sin and they have the scars and the broken heart and the broken spirit and the broken mind. They can't think right. They can't act right. And, and oh, wretched soul, wretched man that I am, this body of death. And it's, I'm, I'm literally their lifespan is shortened because of the life of sin that they've had. I read just a headline this morning about those that uh, uh, smoke marijuana daily have an increased risk of, of heart attacks, heart problems. See, now they're finding out some long-term what these effects are. And, oh, yeah, it turns out the preacher was right all along. But there's people that suffer from sin directly. There's people that suffer from sin indirectly. I know about a man that, uh, I don't know if he still is or not, years ago he was a drunkard. And it seems, I don't know, I don't understand this, but it seems like as with many drunkards, he would come home on a Friday night after drinking until he didn't have any more money with which to drink, and he just liked to slap his wife around. He'd come home and that's smacked her around. They had a little girl. Year after year, of course, this little girl became less little. She was growing up. She got to be a teenager. And somehow he thought, she's big enough now for me to slap her around when I get home. She didn't sin. She didn't do anything wrong. She's not the one out drinking. She's not the one out wasting the paycheck. She's just going to school, keeping her nose to the grindstone, doing her homework, trying to get good grades. And somehow Friday night, her dad comes home drunk and says, uh, where's your mom? She says, I don't know. Well, you come here. I'll smack you around. So she is suffering indirectly because of sin. Not any sin of her own, but the sin of her father. Next Friday. I can't tell that part of the story without telling this part. Don't take this as an endorsement. This is just a reporting of what happened. Next Friday. His wife. The girl's mom. Made sure she was home. He came home. At his usual. Wrong time of night. Drunk. Yelling, about to be abusive. She's behind the door with a skillet. And she, boom, right across the top of that. I'm not saying that ought to be done. I'm just saying that's what she did. When he came to, she said, it's one thing for you to smack me around, but you will never lay a hand on our daughter again. And he never did. He never did. So far as I know. That, that ended right there. But listen, both of them were suffering indirectly from the result of sin. That's, that's an obvious example. Some drunks, they don't ever get physically abusive, but there's money that could have been spent on medicine. There's money that could have been spent on clothing for the children. There's money that could have been spent on keeping the electric going and the water running. There's money that could have been spent on rent so that the family doesn't have to move every month. Those who have suffered from sin the most. Well, what a contrast. What a contrast. Imagine, imagine living in that type of home where you come home because you've had to work to contribute and, and you come home and you're wondering, which husband will I get today? The sober one or the drunk one? 
the peaceable one or the angry one. And that's your, that's your mental experience of walking through the door to your house. And what a difference that is from walking through the heavenly gates Oh, there's no violence here. There's no hatefulness here. There's no spite here. There's peace. There's love. There's the joy of God. It's like working for abusive places. And there's places out there that are abusive to their employees. And you leave that job and you go to another abusive job and you go to another abusive job and then you get to one and it seems like everybody's kind of nice. And you're like walking on eggshells. You're waiting for the other. When is somebody going to lose their temper? When is the boss going to scream at me? But it never happens. And see, the person that leaves the abusive job and goes to the decent job appreciates the decent job a lot better than the person who grew up and only ever had a decent job. Yeah. And that person who has only ever worked at that place where it's a decent place to work and it's decent people to work with, he says, oh man, I'm going to have to work an extra 10 minutes today. And the guy that came in from being abused year after year after year, he says, yeah, but nobody's going to yell at you if you only work eight. <laughs> nobody's going to scream at you. They're not going to threaten to fire you. They're not going to threaten your livelihood. They're not going to threaten to take food off of your children's table and clothes off their back if you only work nine minutes instead of ten extra. The person that's had it good and had it well or perceived to have had it good, they are not going to enjoy it. They're not going to appreciate it as much. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I, I'm not going to love heaven. I am going to love heaven. I'm planning on it right now. But I tell you what, I'm not going to love heaven as much as the kid that grew up being beaten every day of his life by his mom and his dad. I'm not going to love it as much as the child that came home from church and the dad says, where have you been? And the child said, I went to Sunday school. And he said, come here. I'll teach you to go there. And he puts their hand on a hot stove top. Or he puts a cigarette out on their arm. See, people wouldn't do that. They have and they do. That child that went to Sunday school and heard about Jesus and got saved. Oh, they're going to love heaven. Not because of the sin that they did, but because of the results of sin around them that was put upon them. Those who have suffered from sin the most, whether it's directly or indirectly. You know, there's other ways that we suffer from sin indirectly. Every health problem on the planet is as a direct result of sin, but not necessarily our own. Now, some people have cirrhosis of the liver because directly they drank themselves into that. But there are children that have, or they're not children anymore, there's grown-ups that their whole life have suffered from what's called fetal alcohol syndrome. Their mama drank while they were pregnant and they were born with a part of their brain damaged, they cannot distinguish right from wrong because of the alcohol that was in the system while they were developing and growing. And they're suffering indirectly from the sins of somebody else. Every cancer that exists, exists because Adam sinned in the garden and sin came into the world and death by sin. Everything that causes heartache, suffering, and anguish and disease and pain is as a direct result of that original sin in the Garden of Eden. I didn't do anything to be born like this. You know, in the, in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, doctors said, oh, you're having morning sickness, take this pill. And it caused birth defects. That baby didn't do anything to have that birth defect. See, there was sorrow while Mama was pregnant. And the Bible said there'd be sorrow 
That's part of the curse. And so man said, well, we'll try to alleviate that and, and not trying to be wrong or evil or hateful or, or cruel, but the chemicals cause problems. And the children have, the, they are the ones that bear the result of that. They suffer because of that. Our country got involved in a, they called it a police action. I don't think Vietnam was ever officially declared as a war. There's a lot of killing and fighting for it to not be a war. They said, we're going to use this chemical to get rid of all the green stuff that's covering the movements of the enemy. We'll just spray this Agent Orange out of airplanes. But what they didn't say, what the company that made that chemical said is perfectly safe for you to handle, but turns out it wasn't. Those men came back from that, from handling that, and got married, had children, and their children have are susceptible to birth defects. And if they have it, they can contact the government and get funds to deal with the problems that arise from that. It wasn't, but it was war that caused that to happen. And where do wars come from? As a direct result of sin. And yet those children are, and they're all grown now, but they are suffering indirectly from sin. And the ones who have suffered the most from sin, either directly or indirectly, boy, they're going to enjoy heaven. They go through this life every day in pain. And then all of a sudden they discover, wait a minute, you don't hurt there? No. You do? Yeah. I've hurt there my whole life. Well, that's not right. Well, maybe you're the one that's weird. Well, let's ask this guy. Do you hurt there? No, I don't hurt there. Never have. Do you? Do you? Man, you mean that's not the way it's supposed to be? I lived my whole life in pain thinking everybody lived and everybody had to face this. Well, guess what? The one who's had to live in pain their whole life is going to get to heaven and say, well, this is what it's like to stand up without hurting. This is what it's like to walk without fearing you're going to break something. There's some people, that they're getting out of bed thinking, I might break a bone right now. I might take a step and just something snap. And there's all manner of diseases and, and, and health issues and problems, chronic ailments. And those people, when they get to heaven, they're going to say, wow. They get their glorified body, they're going to say, this is amazing. But people who have never suffered a bit of pain like that, they won't have that level of wow. Oh, heaven is going to be better for some. Now, it's not going to be worse for anybody. It's not going to be bad for anybody, but there's some that are just going to enjoy it a little bit more. And I, I say all this to say this, those that have been forgiven, those, so I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, but because the forgiveness of sin exists, heaven exists. And if more forgiveness is necessary, heaven is that much sweeter. And whether that forgiveness is your own directly or it's indirectly, still heaven is that much sweeter. Oh, much more had to be forgiven for me to get here than your love will be that much more. And see, old Simon, he thought, if I go to heaven, I won't have as big an account that has to be wiped clean. Not like that woman, if he knew about that woman, huh, he must not be who he says he is. And oh, I love the way Jesus just, he kind of tore into him without tearing into him. He finished, he says, thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. He didn't say that to any of them. He didn't say that to Simon or anybody else that was sitting, sitting at the table at the time. Because in their minds, all they owed was a little bit. And 
shield a lot. And he said, that's why she loves a lot. And you don't. That's why she is appreciative. And you're not. And that's why we know she went to heaven. And don't know about Simon and the other guests. Maybe it clicked in Simon's mind that he too was a sinner. Maybe it didn't. Ask me in a hundred years and I'll be able to tell you. Because by then, I'll either know he was there or he's not. It's like that. <laughs> like that. Uh, I can't remember the whole story. But basically, is a story about a kid in school and the teacher trying to tell him there wasn't a God and there was no such thing as Jonah and, and the whale and everything and and uh, basically the teacher asked the kid about something he said well when I get to heaven I'll, I'll be able to tell you and the teacher said well what about those that don't he said well then you can tell us what that's like <laughs> I mean, if you don't believe, you're definitely not going to go. If you believe wrong, you're not going to go. It's 100% through Jesus. And this woman, no idea what her name was. He had no desire to shame her. He gave her grace because she humbled herself. And the man that came to him in pride kind of gave him a stiff arm. He kind of shamed him. And for 2,000 years, that man's been shamed. It's recorded, and it will never be unrecorded. Who's going to appreciate heaven more? All those who have suffered from the result of sin. Those who are aware of their own sinful condition. And the more you're aware of your own sinful condition, the greater God's love becomes for you as far as your perception of it. Man, the more I know about my wickedness, the more I'm aware of the greatness of God's love. God had to love me even more than what I realized. See, God saved me when I was a little boy, knowing what I was still going to do later on. My capacity for sin right now is much greater than that of a five-year-old. Boy, God's good to us. Let's stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. How great is heaven going to be for you? Well, the closer you get to God, the closer you get to the Son, the closer you uh, are to His Word, the more you study his commandments, the more you realize sin is exceeding sinful. The more you, you quit thinking, well, that's a small sin, that's a minor issue, that's a... Uh, and people accuse badness, oh, they're always majoring on the minors. Folks, there's no minor in the Bible. Sin is sin. And all sin is bad, and some of it's even worse. But there's none that's not so bad. It's not quite all that bad. It's all bad. This is something that keeps a lot of safe people out of church. Is why well, I hear about sin all the time. I'm not really all that bad of a person. Oh, and there's others. Saved from what we would be called, we would call the depravity of sin, and how sweet their salvation is. Yours can be too. God never intended for us to have to wait for that sweetness of salvation. The joy of our salvation can be had now. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of this woman who was a sinner. She never argued that. 
she never proclaimed her innocence or her uh, her attempts at being good or anything. She just wept, silently brokenhearted, at the feet of her Savior. She humbled herself, and her heart cried out to Him, "Be saved." God, thank you that that salvation is available to all of us. Help us all to appreciate it as much. Help us to view sin the way you do. And in so doing, we'll have a much greater understanding of your love. And our salvation will be that much sweeter right now. And our appreciation for it will be that much greater in heaven. Bless us invitations, only you can. The hearts might be humbled to you now, but we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a piano place. God spoke in your heart. Won't you come? Won't you come? Well, I'm a pretty good person. God says there's none good. No, not one. Father, as we leave here today, Lord, we ask that you would take us to our home safely, return us again at the appointed hour, bless this evening services, and help us to prepare our hearts for the message we'll hear at that time. But we ask it in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. Lord bless you.